Legacy. It's all about what you leave behind, the memories and the impact your actions had on the future. And in my case, that might just be the frustrations when prizing my possessions from my cold, dead hands after years of finger strength training. But for a board game, it's usually the sting of losing or the sweet taste of victory or the general annoyance of someone playing chi in Scrabble on a triple word score. Isn't that right, Sharon? Anyway, how was your New Year's? But that's the thing, because that absolute con job of a Scrabble game was swept away back into its lovely green felt bag, and the next time that we, I mean the characters in the story, got it out again, the slate was cleared of any remnants of wrongdoing. Except in here, and the Whatsapps. So how do you give a board gaming session a legacy? Well, at their heart, legacy board games are ones that you play multiple times and you unlock stuff as you go. But everything you do unlock permanently changes what the next game is going to be. Perhaps you'll be writing your name somewhere on the board and permanently claiming some territory on the map as Bumsville, USA. Or maybe you'll be applying stickers to it that permanently changes the powers or abilities that players can use in future games. Or maybe, and it genuinely pains us to do this, you'll tear up cards, never to use them again. Ah, oh, I just felt someone walk over my grave. Unlike other genres of gaming that emerge slowly and undetectably from other influences and inspirations, like a recently evolved quadruped crawling out of the sea, we can trace the creation of legacy games to one board game and one board game designer. And that game came out in 2011, and it was called Risk Legacy, designed by Mr. Rob Daviau. It's a board game that you play multiple times. And when you take it out of the box, your game is like everyone else's. But when you play it, some of the things you do in one game are going to sort of cause echoes in the future game. So when you start your second game, your game is going to be different from other people's games. And these are permanent changes. You might be adding a card in or adding a sticker to a board. So the game mostly resets, but it picks up a little bit where it left off. And you're going to play a series of games and new rules are going to come in and rules are going to come out and cards are going to come in and out. And your game is going to kind of become your own story. And at the end of a set number of games, sometimes 10, 12, 14 or something, the, the campaign and the story will end and your game will have been a different experience from every other person's game. So it's sort of like a season of television. Because Risk used to be a game you'd bring out every so often with different people, but with a similar experience. Whereas Risk Legacy demanded you play it regularly with the same group of people to tell one long evolving campaign style story with surprises, changes to the gameplay, and crucially, a fixed limit on how many times you'd play. Because you play 15 games of Risk Legacy, no more, no less. You can't even play regular Risk afterwards using a legacy set because the game will instruct you to destroy country cards. The winners of games can name their own cities, which are mostly variations on the word bum. Bumsville, Bummington, Bumbleside, you get the idea. Bum on Tweed, that's a good one. You can then choose bonuses that will change future games and then they can make their next step on the campaign long journey of being a global superpower. Risk is very conquering and very aggressive and has a lot of like trash talk and in your face sort of approach and the idea of like taking a card and ripping it up in front of someone felt very um taboo but also very risk like oh you wanted this well it's gone forever how do you like that now and it's that sort of get under your skin thing that risk was known for because risk legacy existed for a time by itself a one game genre in equal measure baffling exciting and traumatizing players who really didn't want to mess with their precious games just look at adam stop making me do this in 2015, four years after Risk Legacy, came Pandemic Legacy Season 1. And that's when Legacy Games really exploded. Because much like Pandemic popularized the fledgling co-op genre of gaming back in the late 2000s, Pandemic Legacy made Legacy Games the next IT style of gaming. Like Risk Legacy, it reskinned Pandemic, taking mechanics that everyone knew and loved, the traveling the world, treating diseases, everyone having a unique power and working together, and tied multiple games of that together with a campaign that told an epic story. We have 12 games, so we have to tell a story. And like, well, if we do it in three acts, then you've got three acts of four games each. And what are big changes and what are little changes and how do we start and we really like we read up on screen writing and thought of like beats and upbeats and downbeats and characters and introducing new characters. We thought about it as 12 episodes of television. And that's the key word that made Pandemic Legacy different. Story. 
Because while Risk Legacy gave players a toolbox to tinker with their own game, Pandemic Legacy sat players down and told them piece by piece a tale of panic, violence, cities falling and governments having to make difficult, often inhumane choices. Oh, and, and the people making those choices, that's you. And your choices have permanent consequences. Maybe you'll lock off a continent forever behind permanent barricade stickers that last for all future games. Sure, all of those countries are doomed, but what choice did you really have? Scared? You're a rebel. I mean, you will be. I mean, I've just remembered what's actually happening in the world right now. Here's some lovely footage of pigs. Pandemic Legacy was so beloved, it shot to the top of the Board Game Geek Top 100 and stayed there for two years, only to be knocked off that top spot by Gloomhaven, another Legacy-style game involving a long, sprawling campaign, bonus characters you can unlock, and enough stickers to put on your board to mummify a dog. These poor dogs. Happy pigs again. So the top two board games of all time, voted for by gamers themselves, the top two games ever made are legacy games. And now loads of them are being made every single year. Betrayal Legacy, a variant on the classic Betrayal at House on the Hill, Clank Legacy, Machikoro Legacy, Pandemic Legacy Season Zero just came out to rave reviews. We've got Frosthaven in the works. What is so intoxicating about them to produce such a strong reaction? For me, um, what makes legacy games so appealing is knowing that you're going to be going on a journey with a set group of people and knowing that there's always going to be some kind of surprise in the next session. It's very similar to why a lot of people I think like tabletop role-playing games. You have a set group of people that you know that you enjoy playing games with and you just get to go on an adventure with them. For me it's that kind of half stress, half morbid pleasure of like permanently damaging a game. I'm so anal about my games. Like I sleeve all my cards. I get really, really precious about the components. So doing like going in there and like permanently not wrecking, but kind of like deforming your game in order to suit this one story that you're on, that it just makes everything feel like high stakes. Gifts, presents, treats. How do I get to the trees? I can't open it. Why well, you're telling me I can't open it. So now I want to open it, right? How do I do that? And that was like the biggest finding I had out of Risk Legacy other than this actually works is that those things are very precious and are major draws and major plot points for making the game flow. And it's just true surprise parties. People like surprises and treats and feeling special and the unknown and having things sort of wrapped up. It's like, you know, why people say, no, no, spoilers, don't tell me. Because you like to discover things on your own for the first time. And that's what a legacy game does that a lot of board games don't do. A lot of board games let you discover how it's played, how to play well, what a good strategy is. And this offers all that, but it also offers some of the same things you get from other entertainment. So are there any warnings you need to know about before you rush out and buy a legacy game? Well, there are one or two. You see, legacy games are on the most part luxury items. They're big boxes stuffed with bonus components, extra cards, rules, stickers, and envelopes, all the extra bits needed to make subsequent games feel properly different from each other. And that can come with a hefty price tag. Pandemic Legacy Season 1 will set you back 50 bucks. Season 0 is going to set you back 80 bucks. And f Gloomhaven, you're going to have to sink a cool hundo to play that and obviously build a shed to keep it in. There it is. And that is a galling price tag for something that is by its own admission, a game that you can only play a limited number of times. And people do really get hung up on that idea of a board game that you can complete, that it's kind of a cardinal sin to have a board game, especially an expensive board game that you can only play so many times. I am choosing how many games you play and it feels like this real affront, like I've somehow violated this trust between designer and player and I can see how that's off-putting but what I'm trying to say is let me constrain the number of games you have but I will give you 14 really good games you might not get a hundred okay games you're going to get 14 good ones and are you willing to make that trade I'm going to give you more of a concert rather than listening to the album but honestly it's not the expense that is really that much of a problem because 
After all, the rigid format of Legacy means that you're going to be playing with the same people every single time. These are not games that you just keep in your closet for anyone to play. They are games for specific teams. So why not split that cost amongst all of the people playing? Because suddenly, three people paying 35 quid makes Gloomhaven insane value for money. And now, most new Legacy games come with something called Eternal Mode, meaning that once you've finished the campaign, you can then use your set to play regular games forever, as long as you don't mind stickers all over your board, which I do. I don't know who I'm looking at over there, I'm just cross. So no, what really makes Legacy Games a luxury product is something else other than money that you're gonna have to invest, and it's something that's far more valuable, frankly, time. It is literally, by design, impossible to get all or even most or even some of a Legacy Games full story and gameplay potential from just one session. Bits of the game are being actively hidden away from you. What you need to do is you need to form a group, come up with a schedule and try to meet up often enough just so you don't forget half of what you've done already. So in that sense, legacy gaming is much more similar to role playing games than regular board games. And have you ever tried to get a group of people together on a regular basis for an RPG? It is a f***ing nightmare. Luke's in my D&D group, he'll tell you. Absolute f***ing nightmare. It is also usually Luke's fault. So in conclusion, legacy games are, in a lot of ways, the most that board gaming can be. The most expensive, the most time consuming, the most just f***ing big. But if you do have the money, and more importantly, the time to spend, they can also be the most exciting, as every new development makes the next game a fresh, cool challenge. Or the most nerve wracking, as you make decisions that carry more weight than any decision you'll make in a normal board game. And more importantly, your gaming group is going to have the most memorable experience, because thanks to all the different decisions from each game piling on top of each other, you're going to have an experience that no one else is getting, with in-jokes, moments and memories unique to your select group of friends. So should you invest in a legacy game? Yeah, 100%, absolutely. But for the love of God, only invest in one at a time. And if you'd like to know which legacy game would be right for you to invest in, check out the collection starter this week as Adam runs down some of the best on the market synergized content. Power right, I'm off to actually achieve something now so that when I do give my own eulogy at my funeral I faked for myself, I actually have something good to say.